Hello everyone. My name is Chen Feng. I'm a bioinformatics scientist at Zymo Research. And today I'll give you an introduction to ChIP-seq data analysis. I'll give you a quick overview and then I'll show you some results from our sample ChIP-seq report. Like any biological experiment, data analysis in ChIP-seq is guided by two main questions. First, did the ChIP-seq experiment work? And that consists of two parts, the chip experiment itself and the sequencing. Secondly, what does the data tell me? The most common goal in ChIP-seq experiment are to identify the binding sites of the target protein and the genes that associate with these binding sites. And if you have multiple experimental conditions, you might also be interested to know whether there's any changes in binding among different conditions. Here I have a simple diagram of how ChIP-seq data analysis works. From the immunoprecipitated DNA fragments, you'll get reads covering those fragments. But you'll also get many reads from background DNA that are spread across the genome. The trick here is to identify the regions associated with the IP fragments. If you plot out how many reads are covering each genomic position, the plot is known as a pileup. We can find peaks in the curve where the coverage is higher than other places in the background. These peaks correspond to the position of IP fragments. This computational process is known as peak calling. Now let's go back to the questions. A good chip experiment produces more IP fragments and less background DNA. Therefore, we can evaluate ChIP-seq experiment by fraction of reads coming from the IP fragments. We can evaluate the read quality to see whether the sequencing worked as intended. The peak calling process will identify the binding sites of the protein of interest. We can analyze what genes are near those peaks to identify genes that are potentially affected by the protein of interest. This process is known as peak annotation. Finally, if we compare the numbers of reads in the same peak under different conditions, we can infer how changes in conditions affect the protein binding. Here I have a flow chart of how ChIP-seq data analysis is carried out. We start with raw reads. We first run quality control on the raw reads to evaluate how the quality of the sequencing. We then trim the adapters of the ends of our reads so that they won't affect downstream processing. The trim, trim the reads are then aligned to the reference genome. Not all alignments are used though. Duplicate reads, secondary alignments, reads that align to multiple locations and so on are filtered and discarded. We then run several chip-specific quality control steps to answer how well did the chip experiment go. We perform peak calling on alignments to generate a list of peaks. Those peaks are then annotated to identify nearby genes. And if multiple conditions are present, we then count the number of reads in each peak and compare them across different conditions. Please note that I have listed the names of the bioinformatic tools in each step so that you can try this at home if you're interested. In the second part of this video, I'll show you some ChIP-seq results and how to interpret them. They are from an interactive, all-inclusive report that we provide to our customers. I strongly encourage you to check it out. It has more content, and since it is interactive, you can play with it yourself. The links to the report and documentation of the report are in the video description. The first thing you want to check out in your ChIP-seq data is usually the read quality. You want to make sure most of your reads are of good quality. In this plot of read quality of each position, you can see all samples have a good quality score above 30 which is good. You also want to make sure that most of your data are DNA of your target organism, not adapter sequences. 
While a small amount of adapter sequences are unavoidable, it should be only a few base pairs per read, preferably in only a small portion of reads. This plot of adapter trimming can help you evaluate the adapter content in your data. Let's move on to the alignment step. In this plot, you can see how many reads were aligned or mapped to the reference genome, the blue bars, and how many reads were not, the red bars. Most of your reads should be aligned. If a large portion of your reads are not aligned to the reference genome, it indicates a problem with the experiment, such as foreign organism contamination. There are several tools to evaluate the quality of a ChIP-seq experiment and strand cross-correlation is a very popular one. Here is an illustration of how it works. You have reads that derive from IP fragments on both DNA strands. If you count how many reads are covering each genomic position on each strand, there will be almost zero correlation between the numbers on plus and the minus strand. Because the reads from an IP fragment on either strand usually has a distance between them. Now if you shift the numbers of reads on one strand this way by the length of an IP fragment, you get a strong correlation between the two strands because now the reads are at the same position. Now of course there are reads from background DNA that does not exhibit this behavior. Therefore, we can judge how successful a ChIP-seq experiment is by checking how strong the increase in strand cross-correlation is. If you plot the strand cross-correlation against the number of base pairs shifted, you can get a curve like these. Now, for a good ChIP-seq experiment, you can expect strong peaks like the ones shown here at around the length of IP fragments. For control samples with input DNA or IgG, you should get almost no peaks. Now we can't really see it here, but it is also possible to see a secondary peak at about read length, especially in an experiment where the main peak signal is weak. There are also numeric measures of this curve, known as NSC and RSC scores, which are widely used in encode projects. You can find more in our sample report. Another way to evaluate chip seed quality is using what is called a fingerprint plot. The idea behind this plot is very simple. If we divide the genome into many small beans and count and sort the beans by the number of reads in them, then we plot the cumulative fraction of reads by rank, you get this plot. Now, if reads are perfectly evenly spread across all beans, you get a plot like this imaginary black line here. A good ChIP-seq experiment should have a reads very enriched in some regions, so you'll get a very deep curve like, like these ones. For control samples, you should have a shallower curve like these, because their reads should be more spread out. A good separation between your IP and control samples indicate a good ChIP-seq experiment. After peak calling is performed, it is very helpful to visualize them and the read pileups in UCSC Genome Browser, which by the way are only just a few clicks away from our sample report. You can see in this screenshot that the pileups at these two particular locations are much higher in the IP sample than in the control sample. Therefore, two peaks are called at these locations and we also calculate a fold enrichment plot, which shows enrichment levels compared to the control sample. And while you're in the UCSC Genome Browser, you can compare your results to loads of other useful information in their database. For example, encode chip seek results. After peaks are called for each sample, we can count the number of reads in each peak and compare the counts and the peaks among different samples. On the left side, you can see a similarity matrix of samples showing two groups, one with two replicates, uh, one with three replicates. And you can see the replicates are similar to each other, but the two groups are not. On the right side, you can see a Venn diagram depicting the number of peaks shared by two groups, 
or unique to either group. These overview figures are critical to get a big picture understanding of your data. If the experiments were conducted with replication, we can perform statistical analysis to identify regions where bindings are statistically different among different conditions, which is a question that many researchers are often most interested in. This screenshot is a top 10 list of regions with differential binding. You can see in addition to the chromosome and genomic coordinates, uh, useful information such as fold change, fox discovery rate, and annotation of the region are generated for each one of them. This is it for today. Thank you so much for your time. If you are interested to learn more about ChIP-seq data analysis or our ChIP-seq services, I encourage you to check out the links in the video description. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you.